Pinmenitsa is a round piece of kitchen equipment with 37 hexagons, all in a honeycomb pattern, and you use it to make pinmeni. It's really efficient because before then you'd have to shape them each by hand. My parents immigrated with their pinmeni, so they clearly thought it was important enough to like add to their cargo, which was limited. Pinmeni originated in Siberia. You would form them by hand and you would throw them out the window into the snow and they would freeze. As refrigeration and freezers became commonplace, they became this mass-produced frozen food. Growing up, I never even really thought about how pimeni are something you could make. So at Kachka, that's where we started, is how can we take this commodity food and still do it justice, like make it true to what it is, but just do it better. And I just really wanted to take and make this like perfect bite that was just like my childhood memories, but just more intense. After having thousands of them at this point, that every single time I put that in my mouth, I'm instantly eight years old. Hi, Banichka. Hi. Can I give you a kiss? Here's it. There is an invoice from Horizon. The invoice from Tamani is separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As you know. And there's 35 charge for the... Delivery. For delivery. Oh, and this is the global. Yeah. OK? Yeah. So there was horrible traffic. So I a little, maybe later than usual. So We'll take it anyway. It's a pretty good load today. Oh, yeah. She was asking me to take some other drinks if the fihuya are not available. Was the fihuya available? No, and I didn't okay. take because we have so much sodas from uh, Tamani. Yeah. There's six boxes. Mm-hmm. OK. I'm going to, this is enough to look, to take in. I can get one more. You can, OK. Well, okay I'm going to roll this over and then grab more, yeah? There's plenty to take. I only really started thinking about the food that I grew up eating once I was like through culinary school. And the way that I looked at it was the food I grew up eating was broken. And maybe I could fix it with some of the techniques that I learned. I was like, oh, I can do something Russian because that's my heritage, but it's just going to be really, like, cleaned up. I met my husband, Israel, working together. I brought him home to meet the family. I gave him the same spiel that I gave any friend or boyfriend, which was the food might be weird. So there was the whole spread, you know, like, big zakuski table, lots of vodka. We got in the car afterwards. He turned to me and was like, Bonnie, that was the most amazing thing I've ever had. I was shocked. Having that validation kind of let me take a step back and reconsider how I thought about this food and made me realize at some point that maybe I had it all wrong. My father's mother, Rahil, she was in a ghetto during World War II. She escaped in the night. The following day, um, everyone was executed. She just started traveling east towards Russia. She, at one point, got stopped by a starosta working with the Nazis. And he says to her, you're a Jew, you need to come with me. And so she's trying to tell him that she's Ukrainian. And he was like, oh yeah, if you're actually Ukrainian, how do you say utka, which is the Russian word for duck in Ukrainian? She has no idea, but uh, she says kachka, and um, uh, that happens to be it. And he let her go. When I hear that word kachka, that's 
what I remember. I remember that you have to keep fighting, you have to keep pushing and moving. When we were thinking about what the restaurant was for and trying to think of like, well, how do you say that in just one word? It just felt really natural that it was Kachka. There's a there's a big boy there. Sometimes it's not even worth stopping to pick if it doesn't have this dense cap. Like you'll feel, you won't get this like. Yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a little heavy, uh huh? Yeah. <laughs> This makes such an amazing, like, complex infusion. Well, and it's really important that we're hitting it at this time of the season, too. These are, like, the sappiest, the freshest. It's kind of like that new, that new grow, yeah. so. Mm -hmm. Just, like, so evergreen and, like, right. so tender, too. Even over the dessert, a little bit of yep. these kind of over the strawberries and stuff. Right. So beautiful. Growing up in Belarus, don't forget, this is soon after World War II. So the country is uh, <laughs> fully destroyed, nothing in the stores, and foraging is sometimes the only source of things what you want to use. Very big category of foraging in, in back in Belarus was mushroom. You can dry them, you can pickle, marinate. Mushroom is a very good uh, zakuska. <laughs> it's a very good pairing with a shot of vodka. Beautiful porcini raspberries. I probably never had like a, a beauty like this in, in all my Belarusian life. Oh, yeah. Everyone's chasing oh, yeah. that can never be found. Four years for me picking the same, same little hillside. We didn't have morels in Belarus, I think. At least I didn't know about them. You know, I follow a lot of orgers over in Russia, but I don't see a ton of morels over yeah. there. The freedom you have to cook beautiful food here because of the high quality of ingredients, I can't overstate that. Some of the foraged ingredients of Portland are the best in the world. When people hear Russian, the assumption is boiled cabbage, beets, gray vegetables. Russian food is far more vast and varied. There's berries and mushrooms and pine cones turned into jam. There's freshly tapped birch juice and incredible preparations of charcuterie. That's the most exciting thing that I can share with people is to show that it's not just boiled cabbage. There's so much more. It's very appropriate to give a toast to Earth, to the forest, and all of the amazing bounty that it provides for us. Okay, Cheers, way we would Cheers to take care of Mother Nature. Since 1970, something like two million Soviet Jews have emigrated to the United States. In the Portland area, the Russian community comprises about 50,000 people. Russian is the third most spoken language in Oregon. The Russians experienced tremendous hardship in the 20th century, but there was no food in the stores. People had to go around and stand in lines for hours and hours and try and find that food. One of the saddest aspects of Soviet life to me was the loss of the kitchen. The Bolsheviks thought of food as fuel, as something utilitarian. 
The women were supposed to be liberated from the kitchen, but instead of cooking for one's own family, they were forced to go into the factory kitchens and cook for hundreds and sometimes thousands. So the idea of food as pleasure was seen as a bad thing. When I say Russian food, that, that is a loaded term. My parents immigrated in 1979 from the Soviet Union. Physically, geographically, they were in Belarus. But the entire time that they lived in this place, it was never called Belarus. It was the Soviet Union. Russia is a country that embodies all of these cultures now, all of the, these cuisines that have left an imprint because of what happened during Soviet times. The Soviet Union, at the height of its power, was comprised of 15 different republics, and it was one-sixth of the world's landmass. A slogan of the Soviet era was that the Soviet Union was a brotherhood of nations. And there were so many different countries, so many different languages, so many different ethnicities. And the idea was to bring them together. The way that played out in cuisine is that many of the specialties of the different republics found their way into Russian cuisine writ large. Because Russia and the United States have had such a fraught relationship for so many years, a lot of people close their minds to Russian food. That's enemy food. That's also not good food. There are all these Soviet stereotypes and I really think that what Bonnie's doing at Kochka is so important because as soon as you can sit down with people and share food, you can begin to open their minds to thinking about other places that aren't familiar and to help them discover the deliciousness of these foods. Getting yeah, so then what we'll do is chop to... this part up, yeah. and then we can get a little finer and get closer Perfect. into it. Uh, if we try to do that with the peeler, we're just going to lose too much yeah. product. I think just over the years, we've figured out what the right size was for the right. be like getting a good amount of flavor over a certain period of time. The thing that you guys really nailed is getting it, you know, to have a little bit more stability with like a really good filtration process that doesn't strip away any Without of the flavor. Without removing, yeah, exactly. So. Has the horseradish always been your most popular? Always, oh, and yeah. like surprisingly so because. We didn't expect it to be. Oh, really? It, yeah. I mean, it is, it is um, easily, like, it's easily one of the most traditional infusions just anyway, okay. um, all across Russia. Mm -hmm. And so it was a no-brainer to have, but we thought it would just be this, kind of timepiece on the menu that no one really ordered, and it flew. Vodka is synonymous with Russia, <laughs> for better or for worse. Vodka originally wasn't even called vodka. It was originally, until the late 19th century, called vino, wine. But then it came to be known as vodka, which is a diminutive of vada, which is water. There's this connection with one of the elements for life. And it's never, never overly sweet with that honey. That's the thing I like about it. It's just enough to balance that perfect, horseradish spice. It's a perfect balance between the horseradish and the honey. And that spice comes on like right at the front yeah. and then it just tapers right off and the honey comes right in. It's got a little bit more kick to it this time. Mm -hmm. But that, but that honey just kind of tones it yeah, down yeah, right yeah. away too, doesn't no, it? This it's, is, it's, I think this is right where it needs to be. Traditionally though, um, you know, this is just something you have with a whole bunch of food and just like bites and shots. So like pickles, cured fish. You guys should have really brought us some pickles and sausage and fish. Probably, right? like, yes. What, <laughs> where do we yeah. go wrong? Next, next, next batch, next palette. <laughs> 
When fusions at Kochka and throughout Russia and Eastern Europe are an integral part of the daily life, nostoiki are something that every household makes. We're making horseradish vodka, for instance, which is heads and shoulders are one bestseller, but it's also the most traditional that we have. We also draw from local ingredients and things that are specific to the Pacific Northwest. When cedar tips are really coming in, or dug fir tips, or these beautiful little hood strawberries. We use the same techniques that you might do traditionally in Russian infusions, and we just use those Pacific Northwest ingredients to do that. Sonny is a fisherman that we've been working with since Kashko's opened. He's part of the Kanal tribe in Washington. What's unique about Sonny is that he really understands the product in a way that a lot of other fish purveyors don't. It's really wonderful when you find those sorts of relationships. So this is the, the Quinault River here, and that's the mouth of the river down there. We have on the reservation 28 miles of coastline. The reservation itself is about 210,000 acres. And right now we're fishing for coho and kings. That, that cycle, that pattern of, of harvesting in the fall time is really ingrained in us. It's like, you know, everybody gets excited when uh, fishing starts and it's really a special time. On the reservation, we manage our own our own river, our own system. We've been doing it for thousands of years. We know what we're doing and we do the best we can. I think that's what's really special in mm -hmm. our relationship is right. that you know what we're looking for um, and really appreciate that product too. are just bursting out. They're out of the membrane. They're ready to go. Vibrant. This is so delicious, fresh. I mean, obviously, there's no salt here, so it's a little muted, but just pure, fresh salmon flavor. It just went creamy and rich. And just, I mean, there's no, when people think of, like, fishiness, when they think of. It's clean. Yeah, but there's none of that. It's so clean, it's yeah. so pure. It just tastes like the essence of salmon. Caviar and roe has a long history in Russia. As a result, it is an essential part of the table. It is very common at like a family dinner party to see children running around with white bread and butter and just like cut like a pavé of caviar. My younger son inhales it. When he was like one year old or something, I remember like giving him a little bit and his like eyes lighting up. One of the best things about being in the Pacific Northwest is that king salmon and steelhead and other varieties produce really beautiful roe. Once you have freshly cured salmon roe, it's really hard to go back to the stuff you can get in jars. A lot of people who go to Russia for the first time are presented with a meal, and there's a huge, abundant spread. And only then do you find out that this was not the dinner. This was the zakuska course. These zakuski, or small bites, are the appetizers. If you taste no other Russian food or have no other Russian experience, you should have 
a bite of zakuski because it really contains the elements that are so important to Russians. The idea in a Russian home is that when your guests come, your table should be entirely covered with foods. That's how you show hospitality. The Russians have two words for hospitality. One simply means the reception of guests, but the other comes from the words for bread and salt. Chleb i sol, chleba solstva. So you're giving people that which is most of the earth, most elemental. Abundance and the sense that you are regaling others goes to the core of who the Russians are and to Russian hospitality. The first time I met Bonnie's parents, I showed up thinking that it was going to be maybe a couple other people. And it was like 20 people, all extended family, all speaking Russian. I do remember there was a lot of noise and a lot of like commotion. But when I sat down, all of a sudden, like that's when things hushed. Everyone filled their glasses and someone would stand up and give a toast, all in Russian. And I would just like hold my glass, hold my glass until everyone stopped and then clinked their glasses and drank. This dance, this cadence, this pattern would continue. And I was enamored. Eating and drinking are two sides of the same coin in Russia. You can't have a drink without food, and you can't have either without a toast. Russian drinking. I would say the main rule is never drink alone, unless you have a mirror in front of you. <laughs> and always have food for every time you drink. And never drink without a toast. Instead of say cheers, we say something cheerful. Like, to everything what unites us, to our roots, to our families, always uh, gives you some idea of what you're drinking for. I remember those glorious days when only three of us came to this country. It was Luba, Simon, and me. That's it. And I would like to make a toast to the wonderful land of America, to America and to our family in it. Oh. I've eaten at many restaurants throughout the world, and I've eaten a lot of Russian food. And there's something about your food, Bonnie, that just captures not just the essential flavors of Russia, which to me are so beautiful, in their balance of sour, sometimes a little bit of sweet added in. The sense of abundance, the sense of joyousness that you bring to it, the welcome that people feel when they enter Kochka, it's really an extraordinary experience. This is really about I smell it. My, our, par our parents, these guys. The lens through which I see the world and the way that you see the world is really because of them. And, you know, the way I think about food, you know, might be unique to me, but it's in no small part and mostly because of them. The culture and hospitality that they instilled in us, and now that we get to instill in our children and hopefully that they will take on. What? <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't have planned that better, thank you. But you know, like, it's a loss. You know, this is to, to you guys, really. Yeah, the Russian party is not complete without a Russian song. It's such a 
a travesty that this food that is so amazing doesn't have a place in this country. And for the longest time, I think there was just a total lack of self-respect for many people that lived through the Soviet Union. If you actually lived there in that time, you're too close to it. It's too raw and it takes a generation. It takes people like me who have respect for what happened, have respect for the culture that are revisiting dishes of their childhood. Our driving force has been, how do we get more people to understand and respect the cuisine? I ultimately want people to have this food in their Rolodex. I love when I overhear a table giving a toast and cheersing. It makes me feel like I helped pass on that culture just a little bit. I want to drink for my family and for the country we live in, for America.